Hi, it's Dwyer. RichardDwyer.com. Keepingitfree.blogspot.com. I'm an attorney, a civil attorney in Northern California, and uh, quite frankly, I'm astonished. Absolutely astonished by this awful ruling that just came down in the Sharian Dwani case in South Africa. It seems to me that if you want to commit a violent crime against someone you love, the jurisdiction to do it in is South Africa because we've gotten a string of horrendous rulings from that country, including the Oscar Pistorius ruling and now the Sharian Dwani ruling. Now my opinion here uh, it's the same opinion that I had when I made my original video on this case. I encourage you to look it up. Just on YouTube, search for Dwyer and Dewani. It should pop right up. I believe, this is just my opinion, that Sharia and Dewani arranged to have his wife killed. Right? That he was conspiring with at least the taxi driver right to have his wife murdered because quite frankly the marriage was for show right and he wanted out of the marriage let's talk about how the judge blew it here and understand that South Africa doesn't have a trial by jury system right the judge is the ultimate arbiter but I believe here the judge clearly is overlooking obvious evidence. Keep in mind, the trial wasn't allowed to proceed because the judge ruled that there wasn't enough evidence to even proceed. Let's talk about what evidence does exist. Right now, just understand, Mr. Duani told a German prostitute before the murders that he needed to get out of his marriage. He also told his cousin Snida that he needed a divorce. Folks, that's third party evidence of motive. Right? Understand, if Mr. Duani wanted to get out of his marriage before this murder, and keep in mind, he's on his honeymoon trip, right? So that should tip you off that they haven't been married that long, right? Then that's evidence of a motive to get rid of his wife, right? Now, the fact that Mr. Duani showed up in court and said, I'm bisexual, shouldn't have helped him, right? Because the judge still should have spoken to the German prostitute and should have spoken to his cousin, should have heard what they had to say in court to determine their credibility, right? The judge also should have heard exactly what words Dewani used and what his emotions were. Did the person hearing his comments interpret them as meaning that Dewani was going to get rid of his wife, have her murdered? Now somehow in this case, Mr. Dewani's bisexuality seems to have blinded the court to the fact that this evidence is actually relevant evidence of motive. Right, A married man whose wife turns up dead who then is found to have been talking about how he had to get out of the marriage before she turns up dead, right, should at least understand that the court needs to hear that evidence. I thought this judge overlooked that evidence. Let's talk about another fact that is simply not contradicted by any evidence whatsoever. And that's the fact that Sharia and Duwani had secret phone conversations with the cab driver and met with the cab driver. But understand, Duwani himself admits that he had secret phone conversations with the cab driver. 
right now Dewani claims that he did so to set up a secret helicopter ride for he and his new bride as part of their celebration of their honeymoon right obviously you would expect the accused to have some self-serving explanation right the point though is that the judge needed to hear evidence of these secret conversations because it supports the prosecution's theory in other words there's opportunity here right you already have motive now you have the opportunity for Dewani to actually plan the murder with his co-conspirators right he's admitting having secret conversations with the cab driver right let's at least allow the cab driver to fully discuss what was said in those communications instead the judge makes the claim that these communications simply prove that the men communicated why is she believing Dewani's version of events without a full consideration of the evidence understand this trial should have been allowed to go forward because you have both motive and opportunity let's go further right understand that the alleged cost of the helicopter ride was exactly the price that the cab driver claims was being charged for the hit on Dewani's wife right it's about 15,000 rand right think about that for a second isn't that quite a coincidence think about how important that evidence is right because it's undisputed that on the night of the murder Sharia and Dewani happened to give his wife 10,000 rand to hold for him and had more than 4,000 rand on him in other words on the night of the murder he has the cash to pay for the hit in the cab with him right before the hit takes place with the cab driver who claims he was Dewani's co-conspirator isn't this type of coincidence someone saying hey he was to pay me X amount to have his wife killed and by chance you just happen to have X amount on you in the car isn't that unusual to you doesn't that almost mandate a full investigation by the court not some early motion to dismiss that gets granted doesn't this really require a full investigation keep in mind Dewani doesn't even testify in court how's he able to get the benefit of the doubt without even taking the stand to discuss the money trail keep in mind too he changes money during his trip we know this he changes it on a Saturday if you believe he did the murder you believe he did this to have the money to pay for the hit right now I don't understand how with factual evidence like this and with further evidence keep in mind the fact that Dewani had all this money is information that he hides from the victim's family right understand his version of events changes over time 
Here in the United States, we would seize on those prior inconsistent statements. Why isn't the court in South Africa? Now, aren't there other problems with this case? Understand, Duwani's in the taxi with his wife on the trip in which she gets killed. Now, isn't there a big question on how he somehow is able to get out of the car during this violence? Right? Is his story even credible of hopping out a window or whatever? Is it even credible? This information is notably missing from the court's decision. Also, shouldn't the judge at least have explored how the cab ended up in that part of town on a honeymoon trip? We know the cab driver maintains that they're in that part of the town by design because he's discussed with Dwani the fact that this is going to look like a fake carjacking, right? It's going to look like a random carjacking where they just happen to kill his wife. But of course, the cab driver and Dwani have figured out how they're going to pull this off. Now, why is that less believable than Dwani's version, which he doesn't even give in court at the trial? Right? Dewani claims they're just outside sea. Right? I don't understand why the judge is giving him the benefit of the doubt on that. Now let's talk about these alleged discrepancies that led the court to conclude that there was no way the prosecution could meet their burden. Right? It's, it's my position. That this is a miscarriage of justice. That most of these discrepancies, and I say most, not all, but most of these discrepancies are really not discrepancies. They're the court, without a proper offering of evidence, blindly accepting Sharia and Duwani's version of events. Right? The court points out that the cab driver claims that Duwani initially told him that he wanted to hit on his business partner, not his wife. Right? Well, doesn't this require further inquiry? Why is the court then concluding that the cab driver's testimony can't be credible? Couldn't this simply be a case of Duwani trying to cover up the plan until the plan is about to go into action? Keep in mind, the cab driver has driven Duwani and his wife from the airport, right? He's interacted with Duwani's wife, right? Maybe Duwani realized that if he looked like the depraved SOB that I believe he is, if he said to the cab driver, hey, I want you to help me kill my wife, that the cab driver early on would have said, you got to be kidding. She's a gorgeous woman. I don't, you know, I don't want any involvement. But if Dewani says to him instead, hey, I want for you to kill my business partner, someone the cab driver hasn't met. The cab driver might then think, hey, this is just about money. Right? The lie might actually make the cab driver more likely to go along with the conspiracy. Why would we reward an accused for being clever in packaging the crime to conspirators in a way that makes it more likely that the conspirators joined the conspiracy. Right? In my opinion, the fact that the cab driver claims that Dewani initially told him that the hit was going to be on a business partner doesn't reflect badly on the case at all. Maybe this is the game Dewani was playing. Understand, the prosecution didn't get a full and complete opportunity to 
have the trial do a full examination of the case. Now, here is another problem I have with the judge's claim. The cab driver claims that after he speaks with Dewani, he then goes to a hotel to talk with a friend who knows some people who could do the crime, right? He goes to a hotel to talk with a hotel receptionist. We'll call him M, right? He goes to talk to M. M then calls other guys who one would be the trigger man in the crime, right? Who would be involved in the fake carjacking. Now, Duwani's lawyer got the guys to concede, the hotel receptionist and the cab driver, that they don't specifically recall who talked when in the telephone conversation, right? The hotel receptionist recalls the cab driver being on the phone with the other guys, right? The cab driver recalls the hotel receptionist being on the phone with the other guys. Here's the point, though. Understand that all three men involved in the conversation, the taxi driver, the hotel receptionist, the guy on the other end of the phone, right, who we'll call Q, right, understand all three men say that they were discussing a murder. You understand that? All three men say they were discussing a murder. They were making plans for the murder. So who talked when is that really relevant to the bigger picture of whether this is a conspiracy to commit the murder? Understand too, just legally, M and Q didn't really have to know who was hiring the cab driver to secure the murder. All they had to know was there was a hit job to do. Understand, if I go to hire a hit man, the hit man doesn't need to know, right, all the facts in the background. The hit man just needs to know that he's getting paid to kill someone. Right? I would argue that the judge here got lost in the trees rather than looking at the forest. Right, And the judge starts focusing on logistics that don't matter. Understand, you have testimony from the cab driver that he's hired by Dewani to arrange for the killing of his wife. Right? Then you have testimony that he goes and meets with the hotel receptionist and they make a call to Q. Right? To arrange for the killing of the wife. Right? Understand, whoever spoke first, whoever spoke last during that telephone conversation, all three men claim that the conversation was about making arrangements to kill Dewani's wife. I don't know why that point, which if true, right, shows an act in furtherance of a conspiracy to kill Dewani's wife, was not credible. How many guys have to agree on what was discussed in a phone call for it to be deemed credible? Here you have three guys. Let me tell you another discrepancy. The guy Q on the other end of the line, right? Who, by the way, pled guilty to his role in the crime. Understand, the cab driver pleads guilty to his role in the crime. Understand, M admits his participation but was given immunity for his testimony. He admits to his role in the crime, right? Another discrepancy is that Q supposedly, then according to his statement in which he admits 
to his role in the crime. It says that he then contacted the guy who was the gunman. Right? In another statement, Q says that the gunman was right next to him. Right? He has the phone, the gunman's right next to him at the time of the conversation. So Q explained that, well, yeah, the guy was right next to me and, you know, by the word contacted, all I meant was, you know, I then advised him of what was going on. Q also claims that, you know, obviously these guys had help in preparing their statements, right? Law enforcement people were involved in helping them prepare their statements. Somehow the judge felt that the fact that Q used the word contacted meant that his testimony wasn't credible in describing a telephone conversation where the other two guys on the phone both confirmed happened. Keep in mind these telephone conversations you have phone records. We know the telephone conversation took place. Why wasn't there a full investigation by the South African court here? Now let me talk about the one discrepancy that is a big discrepancy. Right? The taxi driver meets with Dewani on a Friday. Right? Now, in one version of his story, the cab driver agrees to participate in the crime. Then in furtherance of that agreement, the next day on Saturday, he takes Dewani to a money-changing place where Dewani gets a bunch of rand. Right? That's the Saturday. Right? Presumably to pay for the hit. Now, curiously, in another version of his story, the cab driver claims that the agreement to kill the wife didn't fully become final until Dewani did the cash transaction on the Saturday. Right? He's claiming that the agreement was fully reached after Dewani did the, tra the transaction on a Saturday. Now you know the way these things go. First of all, there should have been a full trial on this. Right? Because I'm not sure if the cab driver's statements in this regard are that inconsistent. Right? I meet you on Friday. You tell me you want me to help you kill your wife. Okay, I say, hey, man, yeah, I could, I could be up for that. We talk prices. First, I say 5,000 Rand. Right? Because how do I know the conversation's serious? Then the conversation starts to get a little bit more serious. So then you say to me, hey, look, you know, take me to a money changing place. Let me see what I could switch over in terms of money. We go to the money changing place. Of course, I don't have my passport because I don't want people to know who I am at the money changing place. Right? By the way, Dewani didn't have his passport at the money changing place, according to the cab driver. Right? Understand, whenever the guys go to third party places, like a money changing place, you have additional witnesses. The people at the money changing place can tell us whether or not Dewani was there. We know Dewani is there on a Saturday changing over money to Rand. So Dewani changes over the money. Cab driver then realizes, okay, well, now the guy's really serious, right? Cab driver is already hooked up on the Friday with his boys, made the phone call I talked about earlier. They're set to go if the money's available. Guess what? On Saturday, the money becomes available when Dewani does the money exchange. Right? So, of course, after Dewani does the money exchange and the cab driver feels assured of the fact that if the hit goes down, the money is there to pay for the hit, then the rest takes place. You should have had a trial on that. Is this fact really that big a discrepancy? Understand, in the world of crime, people aren't going around signing contracts. 
right? The sequence of events is not as clear cut as it is in the corporate world, right? Things are hazy. Someone hops in your cab, talks about wanting a murder, you know, after, of course, he and his wife get out the cab, the wife walks away, they're in the hotel lobby, Dewani is caught on film sitting down and talking with the cab driver, right, for several minutes. Dewani says, hey, I want a hit out on my business partner, can, can you guys, you know, do something like that for me? Cab driver says, hey, yeah, you know, I might be game for that, blah, blah, blah. Goes, talks with his hotel receptionist friend. They call guys who would be involved. Right? This is on Friday. Right? Then on Saturday, the guy goes and gets the money, so it's real all of a sudden. So now, of course, you're talking further. Right? Because now, of course, the money is there. I don't know why that scenario is so incredible that the judge decided not to go forward with the trial. That's stunning to me. I don't I don't understand it. Right? Let me say this too. Let me address a couple more points that the judge made. The judge claimed that the cab driver didn't know that Dewani had money on him on the night of the killing. How ridiculous is this one? First of all, Annie Dewani is wearing jewelry when she's in the vehicle. Right? Keep in mind, too, if anyone knows the hotel where Sharia and Dewani is staying, it's the cab driver who drops him off at the hotel. If anyone knows Sharia and Dewani has access to a lot of money, it's the cab driver who took him to the money place when he pulls out all this ram. Right? So, the judge's statement that the cab driver didn't know that Dewani had money on him on the night of the killing just shows her lack of understanding about the case. Doesn't she know about the fact that they went to a money changing place? And Dwani took out all this rant. Right? Understand too. If the plan's to kill his wife. Right? Kill his wife. Then, you know, the guys understand that once they kill her, they can take jewelry off her body. Right? Also, it, it goes without saying that in the world of contract killing. You would imagine that someone might actually want the crime to happen first before he makes the further payment. Understand too, we know that Dewani made a further payment to the cab driver. That's caught on film. Right after the murder takes place, back at the hotel, later, you actually see the cab driver come in and Dewani is all happy. He doesn't look like a guy who just lost a woman he loves. He's all happy. He gives the cab driver a sack. We don't really know what's in that sack. Right? So, understand. What the cab driver knew that night. According to the cab driver. Was that he had a promise to get paid. And he did get paid something. Doesn't that warrant a trial? Let me talk about another point that the judge made. The judge claims that the cab driver wouldn't have put his cab at risk. Right? Since, of course, this murder was supposed to take place in the guy's cab. You know what? Understand. People who do contract killings or participate in contract killings might not be members of Mensa. Right? No one's accusing the cabbie of having the highest IQ in the country. Right? Understand, too, that Dewani, who we now know is a millionaire, 
right? According to the cabbie, promised the cabbie future business. Who knows what the cabbie was thinking? But please, don't, don't reach the conclusion that because you believe that someone involved in a contract killing shows bad judgment doesn't mean that in fact the contract killing wasn't a reality. To sum up, I just don't understand how the judge at this stage in the proceedings, and keep in mind, Dewani doesn't take the stand, right? I don't know how the judge at this stage of the proceedings without a full trial could throw out the case. This seems like lunacy to me. The absurdity is highlighted when three guys are on the phone. Right? Three guys participate in a phone call. All of them agree the subject matter was planning this murder. And the judge then claims she doesn't know what to believe. How about believing the fact that the subject matter of the phone call was to plan the murder? Why is that so hard? Obviously, Dewani's well-paid attorney is going to come in and say, well, who spoke first? Who spoke second? Right? Who's going to remember that? The bottom line is the cabbie talks to the receptionist. Everyone agrees on that. Then a phone call is made to other people who are going to be involved in the killing. Right? And they discuss in the phone call the fact that this killing is to take place and what the game plan is. If everyone in the phone conversation agrees that it was about a killing, then I have no idea how the judge can then reach the conclusion that there's not enough evidence to go forward. Right. Is there any evidence that they talked about anything other than the killing? Right. If they're there talking about a killing, then really the issue is, hey, what led to that phone call? Right. If there's film of Dewani meeting with the cab driver, secretly texting the cab driver, right? and if the cab driver says, hey, this guy, wanted us to kill his wife, right? Or wanted us to kill his business partner. And he then, after talking with Dewani, then participates in this phone call where there are two other people involved in the call who confirm that the call was about a killing. Why isn't that compelling evidence, at least enough evidence, to go forward with the trial? I think a miscarriage of justice took place here. I think the judge is way out of bounds. I think South Africa needs to really re-examine what it's doing because quite frankly some of these decisions are crazy. This one to me is totally absurd. Seems to me that the judge seems to have bought Dewani's version of events without even requiring him to testify. Right? It seems to me the judge ignored third-party testimony. Right? The German prostitute. Excuse me. Might not be German. Well, the prostitute who said Dewani told him that he wanted to get out of his marriage. Dewani's cousin who says Dewani said he wanted a divorce. Right? The victim's family who taped Dewani right? Dewani's changing version of events. He tells the family one thing in court. He's presenting alternative facts. He's filling in facts he didn't even tell the family about. Like the fact that they have thousands of rand on them in cash. In the cab. Right when, right, right before she gets killed. Right? Also, it is a bit curious. How Dewani gets out of that cab. I don't know how you look at these facts and not have a trial. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at 
keeping it free.blogspot.com. And if you're a sports fan, visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.